All right. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, we can do just a little bit better than that because we are live. Okay, good evening. Good evening. Woo! Oh, it is so good to see you, my beloved fellow City Bar members and guests. If you don't know yet, my name is Sheila Boston, and I am the president of the New York City Bar Association, AKA what I've dubbed, what is it? The Bar of Hope. All right, this is my place. This is where I'm supposed to be. It is indeed an honor and pleasure to welcome you to the presentation of the prestigious medal awards, the Association Medal. We are live and in person in the house of the Association. And I don't know about you, but I can't believe it. I'm really excited. Uh, my husband's called me the pandemic president because I haven't hardly been in this building or been afforded the opportunity to like just have a good time and be in my office. I'm like, it's a beautiful office, but we are here tonight. It was a long time coming. Um, following the medal presentation, I want everyone to know you are cordially invited to a reception. A reception, oh my God, do you guys remember what that is? A reception, okay, well, we are going to have one this evening at which we will unveil the portrait of my dear predecessor as president, the one and only, Roger Juan Maldonado. Can we give it up for him right now, please? Now, this whole program, it was actually on the calendar two years ago. Two. Almost to the day, by the way. And it was supposed to be a part of our 150th anniversary com commemorations. But then, a little thing happened, the pandemic. And many of us have been in serious or protective, if you will, social isolation and only connecting with each other by phone, video. And thus, I think it's fitting that this is among the first in-person events at the City Bar since then, as the Association Medal, at least in my humble opinion, epitomizes what the City Bar is all about. In 1951, the Executive Committee established the award to honor those who have made exceptional contributions to the honor and standing of the bar in their community. The beautiful medal itself speaks volumes, bearing the figure of Athena as Pelias, the guardian of the city, and a legend from the fourth book of Aristotle's politics, concluding a sentence which reads, where the laws are not enforced, there can be no free state. For it is essential that the law be supreme. Lawyers are indeed the guardians of the city, as they were when they formed this association a century and a half ago to protect this city against the corruption of Boss Tweed's Tammany Hall machine. Now, in our connected modern world, let's substitute the world for the city or the community. The events to which the world has borne witness in Ukraine certainly support the assertion that where the laws are not enforced, there can be no free state. Aristotle was talking about the rule of law, and it seems there is an increasing understanding in the world, including, hopefully an inadequate, or excuse me, hopefully an adequate amount here at home. And I do get a little choked up because democracy, the rule of law, in my opinion, is under attack. There's a global contest underway between democracy and autocracy, only one of which can be bothered with the rule of law. As many of you know, protection of the rule of law is near and dear to my heart, and it is one of the six pillars of the Bar of Hope. Those six pillars, in case you haven't heard it enough, over the past two years have been COVID-19 recovery projects, criminal justice reform, diversity, equity, and inclusion, access to justice, mental health and wellness, and protection of the rule of law. Well, today, we are honoring two guardians of the city, Zachary Carter and Mary Jo White, stalwarts in our legal community, whose careers have fortified the rule of law and whose work has exemplified everything for which this association stands. In my capacity as president of this City Bar Association, as I meet with committee chairs and review the great work of their committees, I sense that their day-to-day -day work discussing issues, debating positions, putting out reports, statements, and amicus briefs 
proposing legislation, creating and presenting CLE programs, answering ethics hotline calls, and educating themselves on the important issues of the day has taken on a great urgency to match this arduous moment in which we now live. And in these times, I can think of no one better to emulate than our two honorees, who've had enormous success on some of the largest stages and have also shown us by example that the day-to-day -day work in front of us is work that matters greatly. They demonstrated that doing good work in the law fortifies the rule of law and inspires our colleagues and others to do the same. They've served as great examples of the fact that it is both a great blessing and a great responsibility to be a lawyer and that there's no limit to what like-minded people can do together to be guardians of the rule of law and democracy. My own life mantra and, and motto is to whom much is given, much is required. And our two association honorees for this evening have certainly and successfully taken on that challenge and responsibility, doing their part, trying to help us all have just a better world. And with that, with a reminder that at the conclusion of this proceedings, we will adjourn for a reception. Um, and City Bar past president Maldonado's portrait unveiling, exciting. We want to join one another's company after all this time. I want to say it is indeed my pleasure and honor to introduce to some, present to others, someone whom I consider a friend and I just admire greatly. Please welcome the Honorable Kio Matsumoto, Chair of our Honors Committee, to present the Association Medals. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you. Thank you all so much for being here live in person to honor our two distinguished Association Medal recipients, Mary Jo White and Zachary W. Carter. It is wonderful to gather in person after such a long and often difficult period of isolation, during which the presentation of this Association Medal had to be postponed. I'm very grateful to the City Bar's dynamic former president, Roger Maldonado, and the current even more dynamic president, <laughs> Sheila Boston, if that is possible. I'm also grateful to the executive director, Brett Parker, and his staff for their ongoing efforts to support us and to keep and connect our community through these difficult days. I'd also like to thank the New York City Bar Association for the privilege of serving as chair of the awards committee. I must, I must say that all of the members unanimously recommended that the, this award be bestowed for the, for in, in a rare instance on two recipients, Zach Carter and Mary Jo White. We were so impressed by both of their, uh, their backgrounds, their contributions, that we, we decided to promulgate two nominations, and we were fortunate that the board accepted this recommendation. Let me first uh, turn to Zachary W. Carter. We are going in alphabetical order, I'm told. <laughs> Throughout Zach's very impressive legal career in public service, Zachary W. Carter has selflessly and zealously devoted his immeasurable legal talents to achieving equal justice for the many marginalized inhabitants of our community. Zach's passionate pursuit of justice and visionary initiatives to improve the lives of our citizenry have inspired and motivated countless, of, countless attorneys to serve the public. Zach was born in New York City and attended Cornell University and NYU School of Law. His career in public service was launched when Zach was hired by the late legal giant David G. Traeger as an assistant United States attorney in the Eastern District of New York, Zach, where Zach rose to become deputy chief of the criminal division. He then worked for two years as senior litigation associate at Patterson Belknap until he was selected as executive assistant district attorney in Kings County on the recommendation of another legal luminary, Peter Zimroth. Zach has also served as a judge in New York City's criminal court. I am told that Peter Zimroth, Barbara Underwood, and Zach Carter all serve together in this very association on a criminal law committee. 
So I, I must say that this association has brought many great lawyers together. In 1990, Zach was selected as the first African-American United States attorney, uh, I'm sorry, the first African-American United States judge in the Eastern District of New York. And as a magistrate judge, Zach's formidable intellectual and analytical abilities were evident in his assessments of each of the many case, cases that came before him, the strengths and weaknesses of the case, his oversight of multiple discovery disputes, and his ability to persuade the parties, sometimes very firmly, to work toward resolution of their disputes. In 1993, President Carter appointed Zach as the first African-American United States attorney for the Eastern District of New York. There, Zach guided significant prosecutions of organized crime leaders, human traffickers, narcotics traffickers, and corrupt officials, and securities fraudsters. Perhaps most notably, Zach's office successfully obtained convictions for civil rights violations by the NYPD officers who viciously assaulted Abner Louima. His office also obtained a conviction for civil rights violations of the individual who killed rabbinical student Yankel Rosenbaum in Crown Heights. In addition to criminal cases, Zach supported and inspired affirmative civil prosecutions to enforce the environmental civil RICO, civil rights, and fraud cases. During meetings with his civil supervisory staff, I consistently was impressed by Zach's long view of the arc of justice and his deep understanding of the civil tools that were available to bend the arc to achieve meaningful remedies. As the United States Attorney, Zach successfully recruited and promoted a number of diverse assistant U.S. attorneys, including Loretta Lynch, who was nominated by President Clinton to succeed Zach Carter as U.S. Attorney, and again years later by President Obama to serve as the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. And ultimately, she ascended to become the United States Attorney General. Many of the assistants who served under Zach were inspired to continue their a devotion of their careers to the public good. Zach next joined Dorsey and Whitney as a partner where for 14 years he oversaw the firm's New York trial group and white collar and fraud practice for 14 years. In January 2014, Zach was appointed corporation counsel by Mary de Blasio where he served until 2019, one of the longest tenures of any corporation counsel. In that role, Zach led an office of 1,000 lawyers across 16 operating divisions and 900 support staff. During his tenure as corporation counsel, Zach's superior settlement skills resulted in the resolution of the civil suit by the wrongly convicted Central Park Five, the stop and frisk cases as the city crime rates fell, excessive force cases arising on Rikers Island, and the racial discrimination case brought by African American firefighters. He successfully partnered with the State Attorney General's Office in achieving a $30 million payment from an offshore hedge fund for evading city and state taxes, and he reached a settlement of $35.4 million from FedEx as a real result of three lawsuits. FedEx had been allegedly shipping untaxed cigarettes for decades. Under Zach's leadership, the Law Department, its attorneys, and the citizens of New York were beneficiaries of his superb skills and passion for justice and his exceptional vision to utilize the law to effect significant changes that benefited the city and its inhabitants. Zach also implemented a, straight, a strategic litigation initiative to expand the city's impact litigation and toward the end of his tenure, Zach guided the law department to step up its efforts while the federal government was, in his words, quote, falling down on so many of its core obligations in the areas of civil rights, economic justice, the environment, and immigration. In the words of Mayor Bill de Blasio, Zach has stood for fairness and equity, core concepts which are at the heart of Zach's legal career and exemplary service to the public. As a New York criminal court judge, federal magistrate judge, United States attorney for the Eastern District of New York, and Corporation Counsel for the City of New York. Zach continues his work to improve the lives of others as he now serves as Chairman of the Board of the Legal Aid Society. 
Throughout his career, Zach has generously shared his advice on career development with other, other attorneys, and there are countless numbers of them. In 2014, Zach met with a group of young lawyers here at the city bar and encouraged them to seek challenges and opportunities to expand their experiences. Zach has continued and contri to contribute greatly to the evolution of the city bar as a more inclusive, diverse, and welcoming legal association. Zach has served on the executive committee and pretty much every criminal justice committee in the city bar. As Zach will tell you, he grew up here as a lawyer with the city bar. Zach reflects what he has valued most in his career as the opportunity to, to make a difference and reform systems that adversely impact the indigent and people of color. For his lifelong commitment to seeking and achieving justice for all, and especially those who are the most hard pressed among us, for seeking and implementing fair and equal treatment within and by our institutions, for selflessly mentoring and guiding countless young lawyers toward better career opportunities, and for trailblazing new pathways for people of color, the New York City Bar Association is proud and honored to present to Zachary Carter the Association Medal. Congratulations. I'd like to introduce Zachary Carter. Good evening, Keo. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, generous introduction. Uh, it is wonderful, wonderful to be uh, among so many of my former colleagues and, and friends and associates in uh, the practice of law over the all too many decades. Uh, and um, I'm particularly pleased to uh, share this occasion uh, this evening with my uh, dear professional colleague and, and personal friend, Mary Jo White. Um, some of you don't know uh, our history, uh, which is unique and interesting. Um, I was appointed a um, United States magistrate judge in 1990. And when I arrived back in the Eastern District, because I had served as an assistant U.S. attorney from 1975 to 1980, so it was a, a homecoming for me. When I returned to the Eastern District to preside over cases, uh, many of, uh, of which uh, were um, staffed by lawyers from the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District, where I was uh, an alum, uh, Mary Jo White was the chief assistant uh, U.S. attorney. Uh, having for some inexplicable reason been, been plucked from the Southern District of New York uh, to be the chief assistant in the Eastern District of New York. And later, when uh, the then U.S. Attorney uh, retired, uh, she became the acting U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York uh, while I was still a magistrate judge. And then there was a change of administration. Bill Clinton was elected, and he had a slot to fill, and there was only one slot to fill, and that was uh, uh, the U.S. Attorney uh, uh, position for the Eastern District of New York because the Southern District position had already been pledged to a partner at a major law firm. There was one small, and so for, there was a period during which Mary Jo White and I were competing for the same U.S. Attorney position. But that's one of the reasons why I have to talk about uh, Mary Jo's character and the quality of her friendship. Because notwithstanding the fact that we were technically competitors for that open position that was gonna be decided ultimately by then Senator uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, she could not have been more generous with her time in helping me uh, come up to speed in terms of the attorneys in her office and. Uh, the pending prosecutions and the like, just on the off chance that I might win that competition and become the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of, of New York. 
Uh, more importantly for me on a personal level, uh, when I shared with her in a conversation uh, that my father had been diagnosed with late stage um, colon cancer, she could not have been more generous in sharing her contacts in the medical profession and, and resources uh, that, that could be uh, used uh, to support my father's care. And I will never forget that, uh, that quality of friendship. And maybe the heavens rewarded it because there were two partners from this particular law firm that were under consideration for uh, Clinton administration positions. And the law firm said, mm -mm, we're not losing two partners to the Clinton administration. And so the one who was up for the Southern District of New York withdrew, thereby creating two openings. And Mary Jo went home where she belonged to the Southern District of New York. <laughs> And I was appointed to the Eastern District of New York. Uh, so uh, notwithstanding, and so, and so our, our friendship in, has endured a lot. Because there is a little gentle competition, as you, may have been, as you may have heard by rumor, between the Eastern and Southern Districts of, of, of New York from time to time. And notwithstanding Mary Jo's slavish devotion to the credo, that in the beginning, God created the heaven the Earths, and the Southern District of New York. <laughs> we remain good friends. So I want to thank Sheila for giving the speech that I thought about giving and decided not to. Thank you. Because it's, I think it's kind of hard not to talk about Ukraine uh, because it is the topic of the day. But it's kind of hard to talk about it just a little bit. So thanks. You covered it. Um, and uh, I think you were right to talk about the, the role of this association uh, as a guardian of the rule of law and how important that is and how there's a direct connection between what's happening uh, in Ukraine and what happened on January 6th and what could be happening in this, uh, in this uh, country uh, going forward. Um, but what I wanted to talk about uh, this evening kind of centers around one of my favorite uh, metaphors. And one of the things I've often said is that as a trial lawyer, like most trial lawyers, I think that being a trial lawyer is being on in the never-ending search for the perfect metaphor. Because that's how trial lawyers communicate with juries, right? Um, one of the problems as you start to advance in age, though, is that sometimes your favorite metaphors, I mean, they have a shelf life. Don't take this personally the wrong way, but thank God, I see so much gray hair and baldness in this audience <laughs> that my favorite metaphor, I only have to explain to about 12 of you guys, <laughs> right? So let me, let, so let me, let me start there. Um, and what is that favorite metaphor? It's based on one of my favorite TV commercials or commercial campaigns of all time, and that was E.F. Hutton. When E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. Got it? All right. People could finish the sentence, right? Now, for those of you who weren't around when that commercial came out, it's easy to explain. And my favorite in the series of commercials is one that takes place at a tennis match. You know, and when you look at the matches, clearly the U.S. Open. And you know how in tennis matches, when you're sitting at midcourt, you're watching the action, and the whole crowd is looking this way, and the whole crowd is looking that way, and back and forth, and the players are slugging it out. And so in this commercial, you have two people who are in the middle of all this action. They're not going back and forth. They're discussing the stock market, right? And they're, just, and they're debating what stock should they invest in. And one guy tells the other, well, you know, I'm investing in X. And he asks, what does your broker say? And the other guy says, well, my broker's E.F. Hutton. And E.F. Hutton says, and the entire stadium stops. They're not watching the match. The players stop. And they're all, I wonder what E.F. Hutton has to say. And you hear the voice open. When E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. It has been 
my good fortune to be associated with a number of institutions over the years that have occupied what I call the E.F. Hutton position in their respective fields. And that is whether it's criminal justice or democracy issues, um, other areas of practice, people in the profession, people in the society at large want to know what do they think about this? You know, I was on the board of directors of Vera Institute of Justice, which was known to be slavishly devoted to following the research and the data wherever it took them, without regard to ideology, political persuasion, without bias to the extent humanly possible. And people look to them when controversial issues debated, highly debated issues of criminal justice were raised. What does Vera think about this? And it was a pleasure to be on that board and to be associated with them. And later, I became a member of the John Jay College of Criminal Justice Board. And similarly, they've grown into that space, you know, where faculty from that institution are looked to for an objective, well-researched, well-thought-out, objective assessment of a controversial criminal justice issue. And it was my pleasure to be associated with them. And for years, I served on the Brennan Center Board. And they occupied that space when it came to democracy issues, right? And particularly in voting, people leaned forward and said, what does Brennan have to say about And it was always my aspiration, uh, as I had the privilege of leading law offices, uh, particularly the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York uh, and Corporation Counsel's Office, that those offices could occupy a similar space, at least in the judgment of the judges who presided over litigation in the respective courts that heard their cases. I always wanted it to be the case that when an assistant U.S. attorney from the Eastern District of New York appeared in a case on behalf of the government of the United States, that the judge, after hearing all the back and forth, would say, what's the government have to say? What's the assistant U.S. attorney have to say? And I, was always, I would always hope that there would be a thought bubble, like in a cartoon above their head, that said, frankly, of all my years on the bench, I have never heard an assistant U.S. attorney from the Eastern District intentionally steer me wrong on the facts or the law. They might, I mean, I agree with them. They might turn out to be wrong, but not intentionally. Always in good faith, always well prepared. And I always hope that for my assistant U.S. attorneys, and I hope that as well uh, for the assistant corporation counsel that served the city of, of, of New York in representing its interest. I have wanted that same thought bubble. And when there was a hotly contested issue, I would want that judge to say, when I turn to the assistant corporation counsel, I expect to get a well-reasoned, researched um, position that I can rely on. You know, um, I, would, I, want, I wanted uh, those lawyers to be in that E.F. Hutton position. When they spoke, the judges listened. But there's one more institution that I've had the pleasure to be involved with over the years that occupies that position. And that's the one we're sitting in right now. It is the, what was formerly, when I joined it, the Association of Bar of the City of New York, and now the New York City Bar Association. I joined, uh, and became active in the city bar at the urging of my principal mentor in the profession, David Frager, uh, who hired me, um, thinking way outside the box, right out of law school as an assistant U.S. attorney, and was a careful steward of my professional development even after I left the office. And it was his strong recommendation that I join the city bar and that I become active uh, in, on one of its committees. Uh, and uh, as Keo pointed out, 
Um, I became a member of the Criminal Law Committee of the Bar Association. As happenstance would have it, um, the late Peter Zimroff was chair of that committee. Barbara Underwood was a member of the committee. I was a member of the committee. Uh, Bill Donino, uh, one of our uh, uh, eventual colleagues, was a member of the committee. Um, and as luck would have it, Peter Zimroff was also chair of the transition committee for the newly elected district attorney, Elizabeth Holtzman. And so the three of us on that committee became her executive staff at his urging. But that's not all I got from being a member of that committee. And that's not all that I learned about the important role of this association from being on that committee. It was the role of the committee process in shaping um, the development of law, not only in New York City and New York State, but throughout the nation. Because when this Bar Association issues a report on a substantive legal issue, given the amount of thought that's put into it, given the supervision of the report writing process, the quality control, when New York City Bar talks, people within the profession and outside listen. And one of the reasons why that's so, and one of the things I learned in that first assignment and in, in other assignments throughout the years on committees of the criminal bar is that it was the one place where people were willing to take off their parochial institutional hats and advocate for a position that represented neutral justice for the greater good. Not just for the institutions they represented, but for the system at large. I cannot tell you the number of times I've sat in committee meetings where someone who worked for an institutional litigant was involved in a conversation. Most typically it was somebody who was, you know, a public defender uh, involved in a debate about a criminal justice issue or a prosecutor involved in that dispute or somebody else who had a parochial hat that they wore, who could advocate for a position that only favored their institution, but instead either said directly on the record, very often off the record, and sometimes with a wink and a nod, that while my institution would benefit from the association taking position X, the system would benefit from the position, the, uh, city bar taking position Y, even though it's not necessarily the position that would favor the narrow parochial uh, interest uh, of my organization. And it's probably never been a time in our nation's history or in the city's history where it is, has been more important for the New York City Bar Association to play that role. Um, my own personal pet peeve, but as I have to endure, as many of the, the rest of you do, data-free, fact-free demagoguery that attempts to establish a cause and effect relationship between locally enacted bail reform and a national uptick in violent crime there's never been a more important time for an organization like the New York City Bar to give us the E.F. Hutton position, right? What do the facts show? What do the data show? What's the wisest course in law? And one of the reasons why this is so important, particularly in the area of criminal justice, is because political demagogues, and no one's immune from it, Right, the temptation is there for everybody who holds office. So I don't want to be a self-righteous hypocrite. I think it afflicts lots of people, even well-intended folks. But these people who engage in that kind of demagoguery know that the reason why criminal justice is fertile ground 
for these seeds to take root and people to believe things that are simply not true and not faithful to the, to the evidence and, 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 and reason is because we are so angry about crime. Anytime somebody talks, reports that a person who was an innocent victim minding their own business got accosted or mugged or murdered or raped, it makes us angry. And it should make us angry. There's nothing wrong with being angry. But I ask you this. When is the last time you remember making a decision about which you were particularly proud when you made that decision, when you were blinded with rage. I can't remember a single time I made a decision like that. That was a good decision that I made when I was really pissed off. <laughs> right? But we make policy decisions about criminal justice where we're in a fit of rage all the time. And that's why an organization like the City Ball and those criminal justice organizations that are devoted to careful research and are slaves to fact and law and data are needed to guide us to the foundational truth that supports good policy decisions in the area of criminal justice. So I'm sure that the city bar was going to step up to the plate and help us on this issue. Um, because when the New York City Bar speaks, people listen. Thank you very much for this honor. Our next Association Medal recipient is one of the few among us whose first name, Mary Jo, prompts instant recognition because of her reputation as a superstar in the legal community. When the name Mary Jo is uttered, we instantly know that the subject is tonight's honoree, Mary Jo White. And how many among us have had multiple actresses play us in different <laughs> accounts of the high profile cases that she's supervised? Not many of us. Born in Kansas City, Missouri, Mary Jo White was raised in a family of lawyers in McLean, Virginia, and she received her bachelor's degree from the College of William and Mary. She earned her master's degree in psychology from the New School and reportedly caught the law bug when she sat in on a class taught by her husband, John White, at the New York University School of Law. Mary Jo enrolled at Columbia Law School and finished at the top of her class. Following two years as an associate at Debevoise and Plimpton, she was among the first wave of female lawyers to join the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District. Just two years after her arrival, Mary Jo was leading the Southern District's appellate division for all criminal cases. One of Mary Jo's early mentors, Robert Fisk, described her as a tough and tenacious prosecutor and a point guard on the Southern District of New York basketball team, the Feds. So here we go with a little sports analogy. As a point guard on the Feds, Mary Jo developed skills on the basketball court that would serve her well as she led multiple offices in the court of law. As the acting U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York, the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, the Chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission, and as a law firm partner at Debevoise and Plimpton. As a point guard, Mary Jo learned that in the heat of a contest, whether on the basketball court or in the courtroom, she must be aware at all times where her teammates and adversaries are, anticipate their moves, and guide her team to implement strategies to achieve the best results, a win. Mary Jo next returned to Debevoise and made partner while defending white collar and SEC enforcement matters. When Mary Jo was called to cross the Brooklyn Bridge and serve as Chief Assistant United States Attorney to Andrew J. Maloney, she heard the call and came in 1992. 
I'm sorry, in 1992, Mary Jo White then was appointed acting United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York, and Zach told you about their convoluted dance back and forth across the river. We were sorry to see Mary Jo leave the Eastern District, but we were thrilled to welcome Zach back home. As the acting U.S. Attorney and Chief Assistant in the Eastern District, Mary Jo supervised the development and successful prosecutions of the leaders of the Lucchese, Gambino, and Bonanno organized crime families and civil prosecutions to dismantle their racketeering enterprises. She oversaw the murder and racketeering prosecution of the so-called Teflon Don, John Gotti, by her current partner and former Eastern District of New York judge, John Gleason. Under Mary Jo's inspirational leadership, the Eastern District obtained convictions in a number of political corruption, drug and gang cases, and succeeded in civil enforcement of environmental, anti-fraud, and RICO statutes. I recall that Mary Jo, frequently meeting with her supervisors, had at the ready a cola beverage close at hand. She reportedly sleeps little and guzzles a lot of cola. <laughs> when she met with her assistants, she asked pertinent questions and provided guidance that reflected her in-depth understanding and careful analysis of all of the cases she supervised. In 1993, Mary Jo returned to Manhattan, where she was appointed by President Clinton as the first woman to serve as the United States Attorney in the 200-year history of the Southern District. During her tenure between 1993 and 2002, Mary Jo oversaw the prosecutions relating to the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center which resulted in four convictions. Her office successfully prosecuted Omar Abdel Rahman for plotting to bomb the U United Nations headquarters and other buildings in New York City and commercial aircraft over the Pacific Ocean. Mary Jo's office also secured the indictment of Osama bin Laden for his role in the 1998 bombings of the United States embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. As the first woman to serve as U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York, Mary Jo appointed the first woman to serve as the Deputy U.S. Attorney and other women to head the Civil Division, the Public Corruption Unit, and many other components of the office. Mary Jo was among the few assistants, assistant U.S. Attorneys in the Southern District to ascend to the top position of the United States Attorney, where she inspired her assistants to excel. Indeed, Seven U.S. attorneys who succeeded Mary Jo in the Southern District started as assistants under her leadership. In 2013, when President Obama nominated Mary Jo to be the 31st chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission, he famously, advi excuse me, famously advised that you don't want to mess with Mary Jo. And the U.S. Senate agreed by unanimously confirming her as chair. That year, Worth Magazine listed Mary Jo as number one on its list of the 100 most influential people in finance, the first woman to ever be so listed. Ever a passionate Yankees fan, Mary Jo reportedly transported her, her very impressive collection of baseball memorabilia from New York to her Securities and Exchange Commission office in Washington, and only a select few got to view that collection. She was frequently observed working tirelessly during her early morning and late evening commutes on Amtrak between Washington and New York. Magistrate Judge Bolsara, who served with Mary Jo at the SEC, recalls that lawyers half her age were inspired by her tireless work ethic, dedication to public service, and devotion to the craft of law. Mary Jo served at the SEC until the end of President Obama's presidential term. Rejoining Deva Voice in 2017, where she is now senior chair, Mary Jo has continued to work on many high-profile cases, too numerous to mention in my allotted time. Throughout her legal career, Mary Jo has been an active and invaluable member of the city bar, having served on many committees, including the executive, judiciary, criminal law, litigation, and various ethics committees, and appropriately, the Committee on Women in the Profession. I'll end with a comment by Mary Jo from a New Yorker profile describing her devotion to the legal profession and public service. She stated, 
You're doing something for society every day. You feel good about your job every day. It sounds hokey, but it's true. For a lifetime of service to the public and to the law, for keeping us safe, for going where no women and few men have gone before in the legal profession, and for mentoring, inspiring, and coaching a generation of lawyers, the New York City Bar Association is proud to recognize Mary Jo White as the, with the Association Medal. Congratulations, Mary Jo. Microphones are low enough for me, which is good. Uh, thank you very much, Judge Matsumoto. Uh, frankly, formerly known to me as Keo, yeah. and, still, and still known still to me as Keo. Uh, it's a special privilege, uh, Keo, seriously, to receive this recognition from you. And uh, Zach and I are both extraordinarily proud of you and everything that you have accomplished. And speaking of my colleague and friend, or former friend, Zach Carter. Um, <laughs> uh, Congratulations to you uh, as you continue your many contributions to the bar, Zach, as now the chairman of uh, the Legal Aid Society. The only reason he told that story is because he actually won the battle. Did you notice that? He went, you know? uh, but I will tell you on those turf battles between the Southern and the Eastern District of New York, while I served as acting U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District of New York, but I had been nominated to be the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York, those were settled in a heartbeat. They all went south, right, <laughs> during that time period. But uh, the other bit of news that I can bring to you tonight is that baseball is back. So <laughs> I can sit down now, right? I mean, that's it. So, but, but seriously, um, you know, it goes without saying that um, the Association Medal is one of the highest honors uh, any lawyer can receive. Uh, the truly legendary prior recipients uh, include at least four who actually uh, mean a lot to me personally. Uh, Arthur Lyman was my partner buddy uh, when I was a summer associate at Paul Weiss in 1974. Bob Fisk uh, hired me in 1978 as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. Uh, Francis Plimpton, a past president of the association, uh, co-founded uh, Devin Voice and Plimpton, uh, as you might guess. And Oscar Rebhausen, also a president of this association, uh, was a former presiding partner at Devin Voice and Plimpton. Uh, and a mentor to me. Uh, Devin Voice is the firm where I have actually spent my entire career in private practice, making me a partner three times. Uh, you might ask how that happened, but it basically reflects both my attention uh, uh, of, of a five-year-old, I think, and also the firm's and my you know, shared high regard for public service. And let me say that I'm very grateful to all of my colleagues at Devin Voice over the years, frankly, for who they are uh, and how they practice law in the spirit of public service and with total dedication uh, to excellence in serving our clients. I count among them four partners who have served as a president of this association. I've mentioned two already, Francis Plimpton and Oscar Rebhausen. They also include uh, most recently John Kiernan uh, and Barbara Robinson, Deva Voice's first woman partner, I was the second, uh, and the first woman to serve as the president of the New York City Bar, also known as the Bar of Hope. That's a great great change there. Um, Bruce Hames, my brilliant partner, is here tonight, and I'm thrilled to see him and, and others from Devon Voice. You know, from time to time, I, you know, I've spoken at a couple of law school commencements, and I'm going to say the same thing tonight that I try to say there to the young lawyers. And when you know, I emphasize the public service component of our profession, which I think is the core of all good lawyers, uh, whether in the public sector uh, or in the private sector. I also speak about the obligation of lawyers to look up from our busy day-to-day -day working lives to be good citizens uh, and leaders in our community. And echoing Zach's theme tonight, uh, and this association, which is the oldest bar association in the country, I think epitomizes actually all of that. 
Um, it works very hard to educate lawyers and keep them educated through the continuing legal education programs. It vets candidates for the judiciary. It studies and writes about the hardest legal uh, issues, hardest ethical issues, and sometimes moral issues as well. It works tirelessly uh, to provide affordable, quality legal services to all. And when it matters most, the association indeed does speak out and take a public stance. Usually when the profession or the country or part of it have gone astray. A prime example is speaking out in 1970 against the Vietnam War under the leadership of Association President Francis Plimpton and doing so again after 9-11 to oppose the vilification and attempts to disqualify lawyers for high level uh, public service jobs. Why? Because they had represented unpopular clients. Guantanamo detainees suspected of involvement in some way in the terrorist attacks of 9-11. And more recently in 2020, following the killing of George Floyd, President Sheila Boston uh, spoke out eloquently and powerfully, invoking the remarks uh, by Dr. Martin Luther King in 1965 in this very association. And she said, those of us in the legal profession must rise up and lend our intellect, talent, creativity, and problem-solving skills to solve the systemic and chronic injustice in our nation. So E.F. Hutton listened to that. Thank you for saying it. Thank you for saying it. These were extraordinarily important stands to take, to assert the moral compass of our profession, to use the association's considerable influence for good, and to embrace the public service leadership role we all need to embrace at different times in our career. You know, I was admitted to the bar, and Kia was nice enough not to give the year, but in 1975, um, and who's counting, but that's uh, 47 years ago, uh, and the profession really has been very, very good uh, to me. I still practice 24-7 at Deva Voice. Uh, I got to serve as the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York and the acting U.S. Attorney, nearly the U.S. Attorney for the uh, Eastern District of New York, as well as Chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And I owe those tremendous public officers to a lot of folks, but also to Presidents H.W. Bush, Clinton, and Obama. You know, it's said that the job of an assistant United States attorney is the best job any lawyer can ever have. Uh, U.S. attorney is pretty good, too. Um, but it's really the job of a, a prosecutor where actually your sole obligation is to do justice and to do it in the right way, to always take the high road. Your conscience is your client. That's pretty great work if you could get it. And I'm grateful uh, to the amazing role models I had for that job. I had at least three of them, Bob Fisk, uh, John Martin, and Andy Maloney, whom I served uh, under as an assistant United States attorney. And I'm also very thankful to all of the very talented and high-minded assistant United States attorneys who worked with me when I was the US attorney. You know, as we gather here tonight, and it is great to gather here in person tonight, you know, I'm very optimistic about the legal profession. Um, indeed, my optimism and high expectations for lawyers were reaffirmed very recently when I attended, also in person, uh, the truly inspirational investitures of uh, Brian Peace and Damian Williams, the new U.S. attorneys for the Eastern District of New York and the Southern District of New York. And I can tell you that service of community and country and the moral imperative to do the right thing in the right way are all very much alive and well in my old offices. You know, but the challenges I think for all of us today, you know, are greater than ever, really both as lawyers and as citizens. Uh, there are, as we speak, uh, and I think you have to call them the daunting challenges of social and racial injustice, voters' rights, human rights, the pandemic, and the world is engaged in an illegal and immoral war in U Ukraine, as we all know, forcing millions to seek refuge just to survive. You know, all of these critical issues are in need of the expertise and efforts of lawyers. There are also day-to-day -day practice of law challenges. I worry about, for example, uh, whether the lawyers of today and tomorrow will be sufficiently dedicated to hard work and excellence of service in every matter they touch. I can say that in this audience with that bald head and, you know, so are the younger ones going to do that? It's extraordinarily important that we keep that bar of performance very high. I also worry that truth, actual evidence, and fairness 
are too often set aside in favor of sensational but baseless arguments or an inaccurate and unfair narrative. You know, the vilification of lawyers and law firms uh, for re representing unpopular clients is also something that I think is on the rise again. We need to be on our guard uh, for these and other risks that can erode the North Stars of the legal profession. The truth and rule of law still matter. Public service matters more than ever as it gets harder to attract good people in the gotcha world of partisan politics. But I count on lawyers uh, to steady and indeed right the ship. We have unique skills, the voice and the platform to make a difference. We should not squander our talents and the opportunities we are given to serve, whether it be to ethically and vigorously represent our clients, popular or not, to provide pro bono services uh, to those who need them but cannot afford them, or to stand up to today's challenges of public service. These and so much more are our responsibilities as lawyers. We should embrace them all and fulfill our critical role to make the world a better place uh, and our system of justice uh, a fair one for all. Let me end by thanking all of you for being here tonight, including my husband of 52 years, John White. Uh, and my <laughs> I, uh, you're applauding me now, no, not him, I hope. You know, but, uh, that, that's, an, that's another speech. But, and my friend of 42 years, Barbara Jones, who's in the audience, we give her a hand as well. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much for this honor. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> now you understand? Yes? Can we just one more time? stand on our feet and give a true, great round of applause, Mary Jo White and Zachary Carter. <laughs>